Hello and welcome. I'm Imran Garda, sitting in for Riz Khan. As global food prices skyrocket, how will the world deal with the increased threat of hunger and poverty? 2011 has already created a record in the prices of essential edible items. January saw the seventh straight month of rising food costs around the world. Many say the crisis is being driven by a surge in global population, profiteering and extreme weather. The world's largest wheat producer, China, is bracing for a severe drought, which could further hike the price of that staple. In countries across Southeast Asia, floods have washed away crops, exacerbating the misery of the poor. Well, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization says its average global food price index reached an all-time high of 231 points in January. That's 7.5% higher than its previous peak of 213.5 in 2008. Well, today we ask, are we hovering on the brink of a global food crisis? Remember, you can send us an email or SMS with your questions and comments on the show. Well, joining us now is Olivier Deschuta from Brussels. He's the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Also with us is Ali Khan Sachu, an independent market analyst who trades in food commodities, among other things. He is in Nairobi. And here on set, I have well-known thinker Lester Brown, founder of Earth Policy Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based environmental organization. His latest book is World on the Edge, How to Prevent Environmental and Economic Collapse. Gentlemen, uh, good to have you all on the program. Lester Brown, if I could start with you. Uh, looking at the current system, if you can call it, that is it uh, sustainable why is the world on the edge well we're seeing um, a rise in food prices now that was not widely anticipated um, and it's largely because on the demand side we now have three trends driving the growth in world demand one is population growth there'll be 219,000 people at the dinner table tonight who were not there last night that's 80 million mm -hmm. a year um, secondly we've we probably have three billion people in the world who are now moving up the food chain, mm -hmm. consuming more grain-intensive livestock products. That means more, more feed grain, more soybeans. And third, um, in the United States in particular, we're converting large quantities of grain now, massive quantities, into fuel for cars. Um, we harvested 400 million tons of grain last year, and of that, 119 million tons went to ethanol distilleries to produce automotive fuel. So we have these three sources of growth in demand now, whereas at one time, not too long ago, there was only one, population growth. So for those of us who mm -hmm. haven't yet read your book, what's the worst case scenario if this continues? A lot, a lot depends in the short term on this year's grain harvest. And we don't have a good look at that yet, except for the winter wheat crop in the Northern Hemisphere. We know that China, the world's largest wheat producer, um, is suffering record drought in its, its winter wheat growing provinces. We know that in, in the U.S. Southern Plains, we also have a drought problem and, and a crop that's not in uh, very good uh, condition right now. Um, I mentioned the U.S. and China because we are too big wheat uh, producers. Russia is not going to have a very good uh, wheat crop this next year either because it was too dry to get in some mm -hmm. of their winter wheat back in September. Um, so the worst thing that could happen is we could see further dramatic rises in food prices above the current level and that puts enormous stress on the world's low income people who may already be spending 70 percent of their income on food. Right. So for, for them this is uh, this this is a this is a serious issue. Okay, let's ask Olivier Deschuta from uh, the UN. Uh, what do you think? Do you think that there really is an issue of supply and demand? I mean, is there really a shortage of food in the world? Well, it's clear that there is a lot of tension between uh, supply and demand, as Lester Brown quite rightly noted. Uh, we have to, however, realize that part of this mismatch between supply and demand is linked to a very poor organization of the food systems with lots of waste, in fact, uh, particularly post-harvest losses as a result of the absence of storage facilities and adequate uh, means of transport uh, of the food, much of which uh, rots before it actually reaches the consumer. And I also would like to emphasize the fact that the impacts on the populations uh, of these uh, rises 
depend very much on the policies that states adopt. And some states have been able to cushion the shock for their populations. Many others, however, have not. And the countries which are most severely impacted are the net food importing countries who have not been sufficiently investing in agriculture to feed their own populations and who now are facing very serious uh, balance of payments problems and, and will in the future be even more vulnerable to these price spikes. In other terms, we cannot uh, distinguish um, the evolutions on global markets um, from mm -hmm. the domestic policies that may or may not alleviate the impacts for the poorest segments of the population. You talk about the evolutions on global markets. To what extent would you apportion blame to those speculators in the financial markets? Well, you see, speculation would not uh, thrive as it is if there was not this uncertainty that we are now facing um, in the physical mm -hmm. markets and if there was more transparency about stocks and if there was indeed ample um, uh, supply to meet this rise in demand. Once, however, there is such a tension and one there is, once there is such uncertainty and once we see all these weather-related events uh, multiply, we do see um, um, lots of um, uh, speculators who basically speculate on higher prices and therefore send signals to the physical markets that there may be in the future scarcity. And so, unsurprisingly, traders are now stocking um, countries are now buying uh, wheat and rice. Look at Indonesia, look at uh, Jordan, for example, buying respectively rice and wheat. And we create, as a result, a sort of artificial scarcity because there is a panic created because of the signals that speculators send to the physical market. So speculation does not create volatility, nor does it create high prices, but it worsens a situation that is extremely worrisome and tight, and it therefore should be regulated better than it is. Ali Khan Sachi, you're involved in the game. <laughs> Do you think that's a fair uh, characterization of what's going on by Mr. Deschuta? I, I, absolutely, but I do think the food markets are tipping into disequilibrium. I think the evidence is all around that. Your, your guests have already addressed most of the issues, the increasing population, the higher calorific intake. I think the universe and the earth is incredibly finely tuned, and I think we've now tipped out of that fine tuning with regard to the weather, which has effectively capped agri-output. But in addition, the food markets are not efficient. You might have enormous reserves in some countries. The moment there's any sign of trouble or a shortage elsewhere, those stocks are no longer available to the global food market. They, they, these countries tend to hold on to them. So you get this accelerated price movements at exactly those times of panic because so much uh, supposed uh, supply in the warehouse is not made avail available because of political considerations. I remember in the late 90s being in Indonesia and I at that time was in the office of the president and the IMF made him lift subsidies and he said I will be gone in 48 hours. And that's a political consideration for nearly every single uh, president or politician <coughs> right now given the situation that we're seeing. In terms of the food markets I think it's as much a one-way bet as I've ever seen. It's unfortunate but if you look at any uh, price of any soft commodity, coffee is at a 13-year high, uh, sugar is at, th is at a 31-year high. You know, it, the price uh, chart, the, the formation is sending a message which is the equivalent of banging me on the head with a sledgehammer. So I think, you know, we're in a very, very difficult position. I think it's, it's like herding cats. You know, everyone went to Copenhagen, spoke about what's going on. But the time to action is going to be a very slow and long fuse. I can't see any real action being taken. And looking at it as an investor, I see every reason to stay long, all these commodities, and get longer. I don't see any reason to reduce my position. Okay. And I think speculators are just a small portion of the market. Okay. Uh, Lester Brown, Ali Khan, such as saying that uh, there doesn't seem to be that real imminent urgent push to change the system at all. Do you agree? Yes. We've been talking about trends on the demand side of the food equation, but there are also new trends now on the supply side. One is climate change. Mm. Crop ecologists have a rule of thumb that for each one degree Celsius rise in temperature during the growing season, 
we can expect a 10% decline in yields. And we saw that very dramatically in Russia this past summer. The second trend on the supply side is water tables are now falling in countries that contain half the world's people. Water tables are falling because of overpumping for irrigation. We're seeing literally the collapse of wheat production in Saudi Arabia, a country that's been self-sufficient in wheat production for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. And what's happened there is that the underground aquifer they've been pumping uh, so vigorously is now almost depleted. And so they'll be out of the wheat production business by this time next year. Beyond that, we have some huge um, water-based food bubbles in countries like India and China. Uh, World Bank data indicate that in India, 175 million people are being fed with water, sorry, with grain produced by overpumping, right. which by definition is a short-term phenomenon. In China, we estimate 130 million Chinese are being fed by overpumping. And so um, it's becoming more difficult now in, in major producing countries like China and India to maintain a rapid growth in, in, in output. So we have this convergence of trends on the demand side of the equation, now the three trends driving demand. We have climate change creating unprecedented uncertainty over the markets, and that's one of the things that's driving the speculation. And the second thing is spreading water shortages, mm -hmm. which are, are, are new in terms of actually depleting aquifers. So what we're looking at now is a trend-driven rise in food prices. It's not a single event, though the, right. the, the Russian heat wave clearly accelerated things, but we're in a situation now where we have to deal with the causes, not the symptoms. The causes are population growth, climate change, overpumping of aquifers, um, a whole series of things. Unless we, unless we address those causal trends, mm. things are going to continue to get worse and worse. Okay, Olivia Deschuta looking mm. at addressing the causal trends, as Lester Brown uh, mentioned, and the chief among them perhaps, climate change, does that underpin everything at work here that no matter how how many structural adjustments are made to dealing with rising food prices and even just hunger in general on so many levels around the world that could pull the rug from underneath the feet of anything and everyone yes I think that's a very appropriate way of putting things um, and I, I fully agree that climate change is the single most important threat to food security in the future um, it's important to realize that part of the um, reason why climate change has been accelerating is precisely because of a type of agriculture that has been based on the use of massive amounts of chemical fertilizers and uh, much of the uh, damage caused to the ecosystems that today are threatening the ability for the world to feed itself um, are the results of um, um, agriculture developing in a industrial mode without taking into account these environmental consequences. Um, I believe that uh, the only way out of this mm. is really to shift agriculture in a very different direction, which is much more sustainable, which is much more resilient to weather shocks by being more diversified on the field and by providing farmers with reasons to get uh, to, to to quit their addiction to expensive external inputs and and fossil energies, uh, oil and gas that they now use in massive amounts on the on the field. There are ways to do this, but it requires um, governments to act um, extremely um, energetically on this on the, in this respect. And I see a, a problem between the short-term considerations that governments may have and the long-term consequences of their actions. In the short term, the temptation will be to provide farmers with um, um, fertilizers and, and, and pesticides to boost production to meet the immediate demand. But in the long term, this is a recipe for disaster. In the long term, what we need is a different type of agriculture, one that is much more sustainable, that uses, for example, water harvesting techniques instead of large-scale irrigation, one that relies on polycropping um, rather than on, on monocultures, and one that combines plants with trees, with animals, following the, the prescriptions of agroecology rather than um, developing an industrial type of agriculture that has done so much damage um, to the ability uh, of the world to feed itself. Mr. Deschuta, given looking at, at what the World Food Pro Pro Program is trying to do and the UN in general, given that uh, you are reliant on cash donations, how limiting is it to what you can do? 
Well, uh, there is uh, one humanitarian part of the answer to food insecurity, which is um, unfortunately um, unavoidable, but it is not a long-term solution. And in fact, we have seen cases where um, it has been a, a substitute for action on the deep causes of hunger and malnutrition uh, to throw uh, uh, food aid at countries and to dump uh, uh, subsidized products on their markets in order to alleviate their uh, immediate needs. That is not sufficient. There is now a realization that countries need to be given the ability to feed themselves and that they must be less dependent on food aid but also on imports in order to feed themselves because the countries that today are most fragile and most vulnerable to the price shocks on international markets, of course, are countries such as Egypt that imports 60% of the wheat it consumes, or many countries in the Middle East that have developed this dependency and that have, have not invested in, in becoming self-sufficient in food production. And so <laughs> that is, for me, the priority, and it requires investment. It shall take time, but it needs to be supported by the international community. Okay, let's dip into our inbox now. I want to go to an email from David Were from Uganda and David Wehrer says leaders in developing countries need to invest more in food science and technology these governments are consumed in expanding and sustaining political and military power at the expense of <coughs> their citizens uh, welfare let's pose this to Ali Khan Sachu Ali David Wehrer is from Uganda <coughs> not very far <coughs> from where you are in Kenya what do you make of what David sir what David had to say in that suggestion I, I think he's right I think he's raising a very interesting point because I think what we're watching in front of our eyes in Egypt shows how powerful the crowd is and it, the crowd reminds me of the Lilliputians who didn't have anything with which to capture the state which was Gulliver or Mubarak or whoever it was and all of a sudden you've seen this very powerful connected crowd which has taken practically thrown uh, Mubarak out of power and I think these the, uh, you know this is a trend that we're going to see across the globe uh, uh, it's a geopolitical trend and I agree with David I think you know many governments have been far too used to relying on food aid it's practically a game you know you wait till you get a few starving people on the television screens in some of these countries and then you claim huge amounts of food aid and it's been it's been a scam for years and years of course there have been genuine cases but you know whole bureaucracies have been built around that I agree with David I think the governments have to pay a special attention now to the situation on the ground because you know the crowd can surge at, at you know you, it can tip at any moment look at what happened in Tunisia it tipped in a remote village and I think you've got to absolutely make sure that you know that there is a social safety net to take protection of people how countries go about doing that I'm not sure but you know you can already see the Maghreb countries have, have pushed the price of wheat up 20% higher in Europe than the US as they seek to do exactly what David is saying protect protect their protect their people but I agree with him you know we got to look at we got to look at it every way we can scientifically uh, uh, naturally and we've got to we got to do something about it my concern is getting people to act uniformly in this situation is going to be like herding cats okay. because everybody's going to look at their own national interest and the and the world interest is a different matter yeah it does indeed need a holistic approach let's dip into the inbox again uh, this one from uh, Amir in Bosnia Herzegovina and Amir says we take for granted the fact that millions of people have been starving for decades all around the world why is it that we are concerned with a global food crisis only when the West faces economic recession? Let me ask Lester Brown. Lester Brown, is that fair or unfair? Well, I think the, uh, the timing is a bit off. What we saw in 2007 and early 2008 was, an, was a record run-up in food prices, a record at that time. Um, and the thing that really helped bring prices down was the recession. But the recession is pretty much over now. Most countries are well into the recovery phase. And, um, and, and so um, recessions can be helpful when you have overly high prices, but they also bring up a, uh, a social price. I would like to point out three things I think we need to be working on uh, to deal with the causal factors here. One is um, many of us in the Western world can move down the food chain and be healthier ourselves and, and contribute to a healthier planet. A second thing is we have 215 million women in the world, according to the latest survey, 
who want to plan their families but who do not have access to family planning services. Filling that gap doesn't really take much in the way of resources. And those of us who work in agriculture tend to think only on the supply side of the equation. But I think with food as with energy, we now have, look at, have to look at the demand side. The 215 million women who do not have access to family planning services and who want to plan their families represent the poorest billion people in the world. Yeah. They and their families uh, are, are, are more than a billion in number. The other two things we need to focus on, I think we've got to take climate change very seriously. Mm. And, and by that, I mean a mobilization to cut carbon emissions comparable to the U.S. mobilization uh, for war in 1942, where we totally restructured the industrial economy in a matter of months. The third thing I think we have to focus on is we need to raise water productivity worldwide, because in much of the world, it's water, not land, that right. is now constraining growth in, in, in production. And, and this effort could be patterned after the effort we launched back in the 50s and the 60s to raise grain land productivity. And, and as a result of that effort, the world grain yield per acre today is three times what it was in 1950. We haven't done that for water yet, but I think we need to. Now, you've, you've raised a few interesting points, and w when you spoke about family planning, and uh, women in developing countries and, and the likes, uh, things like water, it reminded me of the UN development uh, goals. And uh, who better to ask than the man from the UN, Olivia de Schutte, uh, about another email that, uh, that we have. This is uh, from uh, Marhus Khan from Stockholm in Sweden. Um, and Marhus says, onion prices shot up this winter when Pakistan decided to stop exporting them to India giving another pinch to an already sour relationship. The UN Millennium Development Goals need to address food crisis in order to maintain peace and trade between uh, nations. Uh, Olivia de Schutte, do you do you agree that all of these things converge when it comes to, to food prices? Well, um, it is absolutely clear that we need much more international cooperation to feed, to, to, to meet these challenges. And part of this is indeed having um, uh, more transparency about what countries um, uh, produce, what stocks they detain. And I would uh, think that, for example, in the list of uh, recommendations that we should put forward um, in the next uh, few months, as countries uh, join their efforts to, to address the food insecurity, uh, part of this should be the establishment of food reserves preferably managed at the regional level so that countries can basically mutualize this insurance policy against food insecurity by the establishment of, of food stocks of a relatively limited uh, uh, volume, but that could be supported by the efforts of the neighbors if there is one um, um, production gap in, in one country. And that is certainly the kind of um, uh, cooperation across countries that we need to to uh, develop further because it will uh, not do for each country to to uh, try to address the problem itself I would also like to say the following which is that um, in such a food crisis uh, many people believe that uh, of course the prices going up is bad for the urban poor and the poor households in, in developing countries that are not producing food but it may be good they also believe for the food producers uh, that uh, depend on food production for their livelihoods the reality however is that in many cases uh, in developing countries the poor small farmers in these countries do not benefit at all from these high prices first of all because they are net food buyers and therefore for them high prices is also a problem and secondly because they are not well organized they are not forming cooperatives or um, unions that could negotiate better prices for their crops and that could negotiate um, lower prices for the inputs that they use for production and so organizing farmers developing food reserves in order to limit the impacts of volatility, both for producers and for consumers, seems to me uh, to be uh, part of the recommendations that, that, that should be now addressed by governments. Well put, Mr. De Schutter. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. So, gentlemen, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure. Olivia De Schutter in Brussels, Ali Khan Sachu in Nairobi, and here in the studio, Lester Brown. It's been a great pleasure. Thank Good you. to pick your brains and get some insight and analysis on uh, the food prices. And uh, hopefully, there won't be. Uh, any apocalyptic uh, future for all of humanity. Thank you very much, all of My you. My pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Remember, you can uh, watch a podcast of the show on iTunes. This week, we're featuring our talk with Tariq Ramadan and Slavoj Žižek on the future of Egyptian politics.
from me and the team here in Washington, D.C. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.